uh, session. Thanks. I um, want to welcome everyone for, um, and thank you for joining us. Um, we have a couple young players from different clubs who um, put together some questions for our players. So the first question is going to come from Gabby McCray. She's an 07 ECNL Rising player. So Gabby, um, please go ahead and ask Yael and Amanda the question you have. Yeah, of course. My question is, in light of the recent NCAA situation on the inequitable weight room, what barriers existed when you started playing sports and has anything changed? Yeah, so uh, thank you for the question, Gabby. I'll, I'll jump in to start and then um, then Amanda, uh, feel free to uh, share your experience, which I'm sure is a little bit different than mine. Um, I grew up, just so you guys know, I grew up in New Jersey, which is where I am now. And I'll be honest, when I saw, I don't know if all of you guys saw the, um, the social media posts showing the differences in, in the weight rooms. Um, my reaction to it, because you know it blew up on social media, was kind of like, "Oh, this is uh, this is not new in my world." Um, and I say that coming from all the way from playing youth soccer, like you, uh, young women who are asking us these questions, and some of you who are listening in, um, to playing at one of the top college programs in the country, playing professionally for ten years all over the world, and what I deemed to be normal in my soccer playing experience and very excited about and grateful for having the opportunity and the facilities and the coaching, I realized at many different points when I saw what my equivalents on the men's side had was very different. And um, just something that highlighted that and why this was no surprise to me when I saw the pictures of the weight room is um, when I played uh, for FC Kansas City, which actually now in NWSL, Kansas City's women's team is back. There was no team in Kansas City for a while. We would, uh, and we had some of the best players in the world. I'm talking Becky Sauerbrunn, uh, Sydney LaRue, Amy Rodriguez, Heather O'Reilly, and those were just a few, Nicole Barnhart, like legends in the women's game. And we um, shared a locker room. We were guests in the locker room of some of the youth teams on the men's side. So we would come to their training locker room, which like there wasn't even place for us to sit. And the one time we got to see sporting Kansas City's locker room, I mean, they basically had these big comfy recliners. They had this big screen TV. It was like the most luxurious thing. And I remember thinking like, oh, I wouldn't even have thought of these things because in my experience, I was so used to kind of being a little bit uncomfortable or making do with what we had sitting on the floor to listen to my coach give our pregame talk. I mean, I'm a professional player playing with some of the players who had won the World Cup and we're sitting on the floor. So to me, these were things that we, I think we never thought about on the women's side and constantly now with social media and with the ability to document things, there's attention being brought to it, which has to happen for it to change. So that's a little bit of my experience through it, but I'm curious to hear what Amanda has to say. Thanks, Yael. Um, yeah, I, and it's a great question. I think I, I'm thankful that that um, players feel um, the strength and, and confidence to be able to speak speak out and ask the question, you know, is this appropriate? Is it not? Um, I think Gail, you said a, a couple words in there that like that that strike me like we're we're taught to be grateful that we have anything, um, as opposed to to the right of equity and the right of equality when we play sports. And I think that digs kind of at the heart of what this conversation is about, right? That that women's rights are human rights and that and that differing facilities and, and conditions aren't um, aren't acceptable in sport, in life. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was not surprised either, Yael, and it's it's um, hard to hear you, your stories of, of you as a player. And when I think about my own experience, I, um, I grew up playing in Tucson, um, but when I played, there wasn't much soccer at all. Um, much less, I, I mean, I don't even know what, what boys had access to in, in Tucson that, that I didn't. Um, but I know that I was playing on merged regional ODP teams um, because we didn't have enough players in Tucson or in Arizona at that time to even make a state team. So um, it, it was a bit different then um, and kind of patchworked together, I think. Um, I don't think boys were in that stage. So I, I think probably on the boys side, it was a bit more developed. So I think that's also something that we have to recognize that girls and women's soccer is, has 
for whether it's cultural reasons or institutional reasons has kind of developed a little bit later. And so we can learn the best things from the boys and the men's side and apply them to girls and women's soccer. But, um, but also we have to, we have to do what's right for our, for our gender too, um, in the game. So, um, you know, the, my work today, uh, I've worked as, as kind of Rick alluded to, I'm from Arizona. I, I went to the university of Wyoming to play soccer in college. Um, I never played for the national team. I went right from coaching to, or right from playing to coaching. So I went and got my master's degree um, in a field called educational technology, which is actually now in the coronavirus, probably one of the most <laughs> useful degrees I could have gotten um, doing everything on, on Zooms. Uh, but then I went and worked in professional soccer at WPS when Yael was a player actually in WPS. Um, then I went to men's pro soccer and worked at major league soccer for, for 10 years. And then, um, and now I work for the global players union. So like, like Yael, we do a lot of work fighting for women's rights really, and, and, and advocating for players to have the same, um, you know, the same rights and conditions that, that the men do. So, um, yeah, when I saw the, the post, the social media, I think, um, it, it brought me to thinking about soccer on a global level and the challenges that women face all around the world, both Yael's description in the US, um, but even when it comes to the Women's World Cup and um, you know the differences between what the men get in Russia 2019 or 2018 and the women get in France in 2019. And it's different, it's really, really different. And so we have to have these conversations. We have to drive awareness so that we can, we can ultimately create change. So um, I think that this is, this is the first step in that but um, you know, we all have to be in that, in that together. So thanks for the question and for facilitating this dialogue because I think this is what's gonna get us there. Thank you. Sophie, um, I'm gonna ask Sophie Tice, who's an 05 um, AC um, Arizona soccer club player um, to ask the next question. Yes, thank you. Um, so when entering the professional national team level, do you feel that the men got more treatment or facilities than, than the women? And were they favored? So I can jump. I can jump in here. Um, I can't speak directly to. Um, I guess you know. I was obviously never part of the men's team to see exactly what they had access to. But Sophia, I think your question is really good, especially right now, um, because there's been a lot of attention brought to the um, what what it gets summarized as equal pay. The, the idea that our women's national team who are the world champions, so the best in the world at what they do, are not compensated equal, equally to the men. And I think that what it comes down to are a lot of uh, the supporting factors like you mentioned. It's not simply just the paycheck, it's everything surrounding how the team travels, the setup in a hotel, the money put into marketing the team. And while I can't speak to um, the exact situation that, on the men's team, I definitely know some things that I've experienced even traveling with the US Women's National Team. And I was part of the team from about 2000, uh, six and seven to 2013. So now kind of a, a long time ago, <laughs> quote unquote. Um, so it's not the kind of most recent, I, I'm hoping there've been improvements, but I mean, I flew um, internationally in a, a coach flight. And I, I mean, I was just, again, really excited because I was traveling with the national team. So I was like, I don't care if I sit in the middle seat, whatever, I'm tall, my legs were cramped, who cares? But if you think about it, like that's something that would affect performance. And I guarantee you, you don't, you wouldn't see you know, Tim Howard, really tall goalkeeper traveling in, in the same way. So I think that, um, again, it was a lot of things that maybe there wasn't the awareness necessary surrounding them. So it wasn't thought of where now there's the awareness. So everybody's evaluating, hey, wait a second, why are we doing this if they're doing that? And um, fortunately or unfortunately, there wasn't quite that awareness, I think, when I was on the team. But it's such an interesting thing for me to now think back on all the little details, even things like after training, what type of recovery snacks and drinks were provided to us. Um, everything that goes into your experience as a player, and you guys as players know all of those little things that make it easier or harder for you to perform, um, the feedback you're able to get from your coach, how many 
athletic trainers are on the staff, how many massage therapists you have access to. You guys can imagine like the ability to get a full hour massage after a game, like that's nice, but you don't know if you're just getting a 15 minute massage because you gotta, you only have two massage therapists and everyone has to get one. Um, the, all of those things really add up. So I would be curious to know a little bit more about um, what it's like now and how it's improved um, since I was on the team, because I guarantee you it has improved, but obviously, we're gathering from you know the statements the players are making that there's still a lot of room to go. You know, I think I want to add something a little bit different and not as um, not from experience. I didn't I didn't play on the U.S. Women's National Team or 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 you know I'm not in the men's locker room understanding what's going on. So, but you did say a really important word I think, which is favored. Like our men favored, and. I um, I love dogs. So whoever's dog that was, like big ups. <laughs> so I um, and those dogs obviously understand the word favored. Like I, there's something to be said about the fact that we we um, you know women we call the women's World Cup the women's World Cup, but we just call it the World Cup for men, right? And there's a big conversation about taking the word women away from women's world cup just calling it the world cup um, but when i think about gender i think it's important that we take ownership and responsibility that it's the men's world cup and 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 by by not having the word men in there it creates this ambiguity and this lack of understanding of if it's men or women or we just assume that it's men so there is this this favoring of of men just even in language itself right? That we assume that it's the men because we don't use the word men. So I do a lot of work in like policy development and like writing rules and government regulations and stuff, which um, probably isn't a topic to dive into on this call. But, but what I often find is that we don't specify when it's men, but we always specify when it's women. And what that does is it creates an environment where men are the default and by its nature, they're favored. So we have to find a way to delineate men's and boys from women's and girls and, 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 and think what do those, what does that mean both in our language and our treatment of the players in the game. Thank you. That's a great point. And I want to ask you about, Isa, about that. Thanks. Sorry, Sophie. And I'm going to turn it back to you because I know you have another question, but what role do you think sponsorship brands um, play in that? In 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 that I'll 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 dig in yeah I'll, I'll jump on this one and then uh, and then kick it over to you, um, you know I I worked in professional sports for a long time in in men's and women's soccer and and so I've seen, um, yeah I've seen the sponsorship side of things on you know across both genders in in the U S and and around the world, and I think. Um, I think that the role for sponsors is, is really to look at the data and understand that there's this entirely untapped market in the women's game and the opportunity to invest in women's and girls soccer right now has never been greater. The potential reach of their brand and the alignment with, with the values and opportunities that exist in women's and girls soccer and women's sports and gender equity to align your brand with these like value driven principles is something that consumers are looking for today in sport. And they want to be part of, consumers who are gonna buy your product want to be part of an organization or institution that supports those values. So, um, you know, I, I, think, I think the role that they play is, is to, to look at the data, not because, um, not because of what they should be doing, but actually because of the real financial opportunity that exists for their brand um, and invest in in women's sport because of course we'll probably agree that it's the right thing to do but it's also it's also the smart thing to do yeah i don't i don't have too much that was really well said i think what amanda hit on with the one point i would bring up plus a lot more is that the idea that it's an opportunity i think you know quite often i even I hear people say like, oh, you should do this to support women's soccer. Well, no, this is a business opportunity. It's, there's a quality on the field. You should invest in um, the sport. You should watch the sport because there's something of quality going on that's a value to all of us. So I think that's, that is the key is 
for um, potential sponsors and existing sponsors to see it as that and to look into it as an opportunity. Um, Cause that's certainly why people are investing on the men's side. They think that there's gonna be, you know, there's an avenue to make, to make more money, to highlight their brand and their company. And that's what should, you know, it should be the same on the women's side. But, and I, I want to also add one thing when, when a sponsor um, gets in, you know, involved with a company or, or Arizona soccer or a, a, a soccer team or, or a, a broadcast or whatever, you write a broadcast agreement, right? That outlines the role of both parties in the partnership. And it is the right of, of the sponsor to ask where the money's going and really get an understanding of if the money is going equally to boys and girls, men and women, right? Or dictate that more money goes towards the women's programming because those are the values that that company believes in. And so I think if sponsors can, can begin to ask those questions, are you investing this in players, in player development, in the conditions like you were asking about? Um, or is it going into, into other assets and other things within the business? Um, I think asking those questions is, is also a good, uh, a good thing for sponsors to do. Sophie, it sounds like you had a follow-up question as well. No, nope, I didn't. I was just saying thank you. Oh, thank you, Sophie. All right, our next um, question is going to come from Amanda. Amanda is an 07 ECNL Rising player. So my question is, is there a particular experience along the way that shaped who you are as an athlete or as a professional? Yeah, this one, uh, this was a good one, Amanda. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, it's really, um, it's really hard for me to pinpoint one, but I will say I, I want to highlight, I had really wonderful um, role models and examples when I was right, right from the start meaning my mom and then shortly after I have a younger sister, my sister, um, I was surrounded by strong, ambitious women right from the start. And I think that's so important. So it wasn't weird for me as a young girl to play sports or to be really competitive or to um, enjoy the feeling of pushing myself physically, mentally, to go outside my comfort zone. All of those things to me were really normal. And I actually only realized and I realized more and more like later in life, how unique maybe that was, not even just as a young girl, but just in general to be brought up to really understand that you should set um, high aspirations, you should set goals and you should truly believe you can achieve them. So for me, um, right from the start, it was instilled in me that like, okay, you, you said you wanna be a professional soccer player. Well, our family is gonna figure out what does it take to become a professional soccer player? What does that look like? What kind of training are they doing? And you just do it. and. Now I realize, like, why did I, why did I think that I could do this, this girl in New Jersey, that I would be a professional soccer player, but I never doubted that it was possible for me because I was shown that if that's what you want to do, okay, we'll, we'll help you. And as long as you work hard and you, you know, do the right things and approach it in the right way, you can give yourself a chance to do that. So I think for me having that, and then from there, you know, I start, started with my mom and my sister, but then watching the women who won the um, World Cup in 1999. I got to go watch them train in person and they became my role models. And all of the women who came before me who played at UNC and who I saw um, doing things in the business world with soccer and I still look up to now. Like I, when Amanda speaks about this stuff, I, I look up to what she's saying because I'm like, she is so much more knowledgeable than me. She's experienced things I haven't. She sees it from a different angle. So I'm always feeling really fortunate to have people I can look to to say, oh, I want to know what they know. I want to do it like they do it. And um, among those people, there's certainly a lot of women. I, uh, I'm going to vouch for your mother and your sister as two of the most incredible human beings on the earth. I, <laughs> when I was at Women's Pro Soccer, your mom um, was um, uh, helping with the, the club. She was doing PR and media at Sky Blue FC. Um, Yael's mom was, and uh, Gloria Averbush. And she was so supportive and so helpful of me all along the way. So uh, on my like weekly phone calls I had with her about media. So I can only imagine the, the experience you had in, in your household with your family, Yael. I, I love how impactful they've been on your life. And I, I feel lucky. To, to have had the same from, from your family. So it's cool to hear you talk about them. Um, and uh, so, you know, when I, oh, you guys will, you guys will appreciate this as, as fellow Arizonans. I, 
I started playing, I, I had a little stint playing soccer when I was a kid. I was in the fifth grade and I, um, I hated it. So I quit for a long time. <laughs> and then it, it, when I was about 13, what's that eighth grade, 13, my friends were all playing um, for my middle school and they were like, come out and play, come out and play. So I did it because my friends, my friends were playing, um, but I'm, and it was, it was great, super fun. They put me in goal because I couldn't run a lap without falling over and they put me in goal and I, you know, I figured it out. Um, but then my nature is that I'm very, very competitive and I wanted to win a spot on the varsity team. I wanted to be on the best club team in town and I wanted to eventually get a soccer scholarship to go to college. And those became like my ambitions. But there was one day I was like, okay, how am I gonna get there? Like, what are the steps? And so one day I was, going out to my mailbox and it sticks so vividly in my mind because there, I, I live on like in Tucson at like a black concrete street, right? And you know how they put that like melty tar in the cracks to keep it like, I don't know what they're trying to do, but like keep your car from going into divots. I don't know, it's like that melty. And, and I remember I was jumping from palm tree shade to palm tree shade, like trying to keep my flip flops from sticking in the, in the tar but between the, the streets. Anyway, that sticks in my mind. I opened the mailbox and I, ha I found a flyer for a soccer camp. And it was, it was, a, it was called Tony DeChico Soccer Plus Goalkeeper School. And I had to find a way to get to San Diego if I wanted to go to this camp. I went inside, I asked my mom. Um, I grew up in a single parent household. My mom was a waitress. We didn't have a lot of money. Um, and I didn't know how I was going to get to goalkeeper school, but I was convinced that if I got to camp, I would be the best goalkeeper in my, in my high school and I would get a soccer scholarship. So I set out on a journey. I figured out how to raise money. I went door to door in Tucson, my neighborhood. I went to all the little shops, um, you know, in like the strip malls. I went and asked for money and kept notes of everyone that gave me $20 here and there. And I learned how to fundraise. I figured out how to get to San Diego for camp, how to pay for the camp. And then when I was there, I made the absolute most of it because I had worked so hard to go and learn how to be a really good goalkeeper. I came back and it completely changed my perspective on soccer, how to train, how to set expectations, um, how, to, how to create a goal and work towards it. So I think that was pretty foundational to the rest of my life in soccer and, and the rest of my career. And I think, you know, there's moments of inspiration where you don't think you're going to get or find them. And they might be, you know, in, in Phoenix or Tucson or Flagstaff or wherever, hopping from, from shade to shade trying to avoid the tar. But, um, but, but when they come, if you can really seize them and, and work to make it happen, um, you know, you can do anything. Thank you. So our next question, we're going to go back to Gabby McRae. Again, Gabby is an 07 rising ECNL player. Um, so Gabby, what is the next question for us? Yeah, my next question is, what do you think male athletes can do to help drive visibility on female sports? Yeah, yeah, you want to take this one first? Yeah, I was, I was going to let you start. You could, you could start, Amanda, and then oh, I'll talk. No, no, you go, you go. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, similar a little bit to what we were talking about with sponsorships, um, it's sometimes I think in the past I've felt that we ask male athletes to, oh, like, oh, please tune in or please come to the women's game because it's almost like the charity thing to do. And I think that that shouldn't be how it's viewed at all. I think that the reality is um, if you appreciate people who are the best in their field, meaning a professional player, a professional soccer player, it should be fun and exciting to support that team and that player. And so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in particular about when I've played in a city when there's both a men's and women's team. And I always know as being part of the women's team, we've wanted to go watch the men's games because it's an exciting game. And as a soccer player, you can appreciate someone else working hard on the field. And I would think and hope that it would be the same vice versa. So whether it's a, you know, you're a high school player or even a, a youth player, a youth player going to watch a high school team, same thing with a college team going to support. If you're a fan of a college or in college team, you know, watch the women's game and the men's games. These are top level players and same thing at the professional level. I think to pick a team that you support and pick players that you support regardless and just players 
who play the way that you like, or maybe you admire in some way. Um, I think to be able to view that regardless of their gender is really, really important. And um, I, you know, as if, if there are parents or coaches listening in, I think to encourage that as well is, you know, which players do you like? And the conversation should be, well, do you, did you think that, um, what would you have done? Where would you have placed the penalty that Megan Rapino scored? And you ask the guys that, you ask the girls that, and the same thing, because as, as um, female players, I know that when people ask me about the game, usually I get asked about men's games all the time. So why should a guy not get asked about women's games? And in doing that, you encourage them. Maybe they're like, oh, I didn't watch the women's game. I don't know what the score was. Well, you should be a little embarrassed. Just like I should be embarrassed if I don't know if our men's national team played and I don't know the score. I would be a little bit embarrassed if someone asked me about the game and I think it should be the same, um, the same for a guy, you know? So I think there should be some, a little bit of pressure on the guys to treat the women's game um, in the same way, especially at the highest level. Thank you. And I think that's one thing um, that we learned through No Place for Hate and the ADL program is that it's our role. Um, it's the role to be an upstander, an ally instead of a bystander. So it's not necessarily the role of the females, the girls, the, the female players to advocate for themselves, but those around us. So um, the male coaches, the, the male players to kind of advocate for the girls. Um, I, I am really excited that we have one, another um, Arizona former professional player on the call. And I wanna kind of give you an opportunity. So we have Kelly Cagle, who's a rising coach. She's also, she played for Duke. Um, She's a, so she's currently a youth coach with the ECNL program in the Phoenix Rising. So thank you so much for joining us, Kelly. I'm guessing you guys all know each other. Um, so we do. Yes, I was so excited. I'm so sorry for my tardiness. Um, Mondays typically are a little bit of some family stuff. So I was getting stuff organized. So um, Yale, I know that you're a Tar Heel, but I'm super excited that you're on, on the call for our athletes. They're so lucky to uh, be able to listen to you. And, and Amanda, I've I know you and I are connected through sort of various people, but the work you're doing in the game, both of you guys, I'm super thankful to have this time. And I think a question for me would be, um, you know, how do we as females, whether it be female athletes or coaches or leaders, how can we best support one another? Um, I think there's kind of that old adage or the expectation that, you know, females are harder on one another or, you know, how do we have high standards for ourselves and for one another, but also kind of lift one another up and support each other in the best way possible? And I don't think we could have two better panelists to answer that question. And I'd like to invite you as well to um, answer any of the, the questions we have. Um, please participate as a panelist as well, Kelly. Great. Thank you. So, Yale or, or Amanda, I don't know if either of you guys have thoughts on that, but how do we embrace one another and really, you know, stand on the shoulders of one another and, and help each other out? You want to start, Amanda? Yeah. I'll start, and I, and, and Kelly, uh, it's so good to you, and, and, and same to you. I've, I've uh, yeah, we've, we've been connected for so long, and so, of course, it, it takes a Zoom, you know, meeting in the middle of a pandemic for us to, <laughs> to have some face-to-face -face time. You know, it, it's super cool, and hopefully this isn't the last between us. Um, so, so I would fact, love that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Good. Good. <laughs> well, so I, I, I want to. I, I think, and Kelly, I love your question, and I think it's, it's hand in hand with the question about how men can, can support, right? On, on the men's side, which, and the boys' side, which was the question earlier. I just, I want to add to what, what, um, what Yael and, and Natalie said, and I think, um, in. I want to reflect back on the NCAA example that we started this call with, because I think the big question for me on that is why was it the responsibility of the female player to post that picture in the first place? Like where were the men along the way who were in charge of making the decisions or the men in the, the players on the men's side who saw the inequity and didn't say anything about it. So th that for me is, is the main thing recommendation I would have for 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 males is is ask questions and when you see it call out gender inequity don't always put it on the person the disenfranchised person whether that's 
you know, whether that's a woman, whether that's a black person, whether that's a Latino, Hispanic person, whatever that is, um, in that instance, like make sure you're asking questions about inequality um, as well. So um, that goes across the board. And the question about women, I mean, I feel like uh, it's a huge question, right? And and how <laughs> how we can support each other in 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 the industry and in sport. Um, I remember. Um, when I first started getting involved in soccer governance back in like 2007, so like being in charge of running soccer organizations, which is kind of what Rick does, um, there weren't a lot of there weren't a lot of women involved at, at that time. And but I found community where there were women, and I and I sought them out to learn from them, ask questions. And I think I was really lucky that the women I found were really um, uh supportive educational engaging like they wanted they wanted to to teach me and bring me in and that's that's not necessarily always the case i don't think um but i think i got lucky in in our sport that that i found those people and so for me it's been about um about finding community finding like-minded people um who share similar values and share um values like we're talking about today of, of gender equity um, to help elevate these, these conversations. Um, but, you know, people focus on, on different values and different things. And I think it's just about finding those, those communities, creating those platforms, um, and, and gathering. So to be in, in this coronavirus world where we've got, uh, you know, un unparalleled access to digital webinars, to be able to pull people together. I've seen groups of, of players who've become coaches. I've seen, you know, women, um, professional women players who've now become coaches, um, like you guys, or um, high school players come together and talk about the issues that affect them, um, or women in business, soccer business like me. It's like creating these communities has, has now like taken this whole new cool dimension in coronavirus world. So for all the things that have been so difficult, I think, um, it's kind of a cool opportunity to look ahead and 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 bring people together in new and unique ways. Yeah, I'll just add something a little a little bit different direction. But hi, Kelly. Um, also good to officially connect. Um, I think that you know part of how I think about this because it's kind of like it's a big task if you think about it. a lot of work needs to be done. There's a lot of inequality still. There are many fewer opportunities for women in a lot of spheres surrounding sports on the field, off the field, and then even surrounding sports just in um, everyday life. Um, and I think a really important thing for for women to do is to um, to be do what you'd like to see done. And it can be scary, but I think that there's a lot of sometimes fear surrounding like, well, why me? Or um, I know I always think about this example that I was given when it comes to um, women and men applying for jobs is that if there are 10 things, 10 uh, requirements you need to apply, a man will see the list and be like, oh, I can, I can do a few of those and apply. And a woman will see the list and be like, oh, I can do nine out of 10, but that one I can't do, like, I don't know if I really belong here. And I think it's so important for all of us as women to ourselves take the responsibility to say like, we belong. And if no one's doing it already, we're gonna do it. And then to um, to bring others with us and to show like, f for me, um, there was nobody leading the player group in NWSL. And instead of waiting for someone to do it, I was like, okay, well, why don't we do it ourselves? And then other people now think that's normal. And they're like organizing within their teams and making statements and co coming to the league and saying, hey, this wasn't okay. But like, was that our place to do it? I don't know. We just did it. And same thing with, you know, if you want to start a business, if you want to uh, be the first woman to do something, go and do it and then bring others along with you. And by even just doing it yourself, you don't have to have a plan to lead everyone and to like galvanize this whole group. You just have to do it yourself and someone else is going to see that and say, oh, well, if she could do it, I can do it too. And so that's a, a really, really important thing. Yeah, I love that. I, I think I was, at, when were you at Carolina? I forget. Um, I, I was there 2005 to nine. Yeah, so I coached at Virginia Tech during that time and had to play against you for all four of those years. I did not like it at all. 
No, oh, that's exactly right. over, you overlapped yes. those exact four years. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I was there eight years, but yeah, it was always a pleasure to watch you play. And oh, thank you. I think to piggyback on that, just in, in being in the collegiate, you know, Division One deal as a as a head coach in the ACC, I was one of I think two or three at the time. Um, I think I was the lowest paid, um, at, and, and we started doing better and better and better. And my husband always asked, you know. Uh, wh why aren't you getting paid more? And I said, because I, I want to do the work first. And I think that's such a difference too between males and females in a lot of ways that I felt as though I needed to prove myself before I got paid versus getting paid the worth because I was doing the work kind of in the moment. So I think that goes along with just kind of fighting, you know, fighting for some of those um, equalities as well. So um, Natalie, do you have other questions? I do, and then Julie also has one. Um, the one one I have is, who are some of the female mentors who helped guide you or lead the way for you guys through your evolution in, in the game? That came from another place. Um, I, I can start here, and I, I've, I would say, you know, my teammates have been huge for me. I think it's often when we think of a mentor, um, I was trying to think like, oh, is there somebody much older than me or who came before me? And, and there, there are, like I, I spoke about my mom and my, my younger sister, I consider her a mentor a lot of times. Um, or like, you know, the, the women who um, I looked up to as professional players, but quite often, especially, you know, when I got to college, um, even for club for me, I often played with older players. So I was playing with players who had been around for longer than me. They were already looking at colleges and, and going through the process before me. Same thing, I got to college. I'm a freshman. There are some older women who had experience I didn't have. And then especially in the professional game, you know, I entered the professional game and I was on um, the team of Christy Pierce Rampone. And so, I mean, you think about like a wonderful mentor. She had at the time, I think maybe even already two kids and was playing professionally for all these years, had been on the US Women's National Team, won World Championship Olympics. So for me, I always um, had wonderful mentors from teammates. And these were women who not only, I, I think it's so important for you, know, you younger players who are listening is that you're going to have mentors who say things to you that you're gonna always remember. Like I have a, have and had a journal and would always write things down. And I have people with like, I've written quotes in my journal, but then I have mentors who now I realize were mentors just because of who they are, or who they were. And the fact that I saw it and I wanted to be like that. So to be a mentor to someone else or to have a great mentor, it doesn't have to be someone who literally takes you under their wing and is like, come on, Yael, you should train like this or make sure when you're warming up, you do it this way. I was always observing and um, whether I was consciously or unconsciously absorbing things, I have played with and known some amazing, amazing women um, who are now some of my great friends and even the ones I don't really talk to, I've learned like an incredible amount from in so many ways. I, I was writing down amazing things that Yael said. So I'm, <laughs> I've got my Yael quote book. It's, it's a real long one though. I don't, um, and, and Shira, Shira, your sister certainly has mentored me on many occasions. She worked at MLS with me, um, for those of you uh, who, who might not know that. And uh, we used to have many a coffees, the two of us. So um, she's great. Um, my my mentors i have, i actually had a lot of male mentors so when i think about um female mentors um, there's a couple really specific ones um in my life one was my high school soccer coach um, her name was alicia kinsler she played at santa clara and then came down to coach at sabino high school when i was there in the 90s um, and she she had an unorthodox approach to coaching in that she took us all to do tai chi and yoga to help us with our mental toughness um, in playing. And it was this crazy, like, I never experienced anything like that in soccer, that mental strength and, and, and fortitude could be so important as an athlete. Um, and she just totally expanded my mind. And I think <clears throat> that made me understand, I guess, the depth of sport, that it was more than just my body. It was so important that my mind was part of it. 
um, and the social element of how we all interacted together in a session of Tai Chi uh, actually impacted the way we moved as a team on the field. Um, and and it was it was pretty it was pretty cool, pretty impactful. So um, her and and then later in my in my development as a professional in the game, I met a woman in Pennsylvania called Charlotte Moran, who ran, she was an administrator, ran soccer in, in Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, and I see Kelly nodding her head as a, as a East Coast coach. And uh, yeah, so Charlotte was an administrator in the game. She ran, um, she ran, like I said, Eastern Pennsylvania youth soccer, but she pulled me aside one day and, and she, she saw I was coaching at the time. I was coaching in ODP and, and it, I was the head coach at, at NYU in, in Manhattan. And she pulled me aside and, and said, I really want you to get involved in in the governance of the game, like have a thought, run for a board, like do some work um, on that side of the game. And I thought, okay, so I joined a women's committee and started doing the newsletter because I was good at email newsletters. So I started doing the newsletters for, for that group and it ended up completely changing changing my career. So she saw something in me that governance and newsletters and media and communications would be interesting. And, uh, and I, I followed her advice. So those are, probably two of the most impactful female mentors I've had. Kelly, what about you? Um, you know, it's so funny, Alicia Kensler was my sister's best friend. So we've spent a lot of time That's with Alicia. Fun. Yeah, she, <laughs> she spent a lot of time in our house um, and just saw Alicia a few years ago. So she actually was somebody who took me under her wing. She was four years older than me and she made me realize how important the racquetball room was as a player. Um, she took me to, to Tucson Racquet Club and just showed me how myself and a ball inside of a room with four walls could um, change my life. That changed my life. That changed my training life. Um, that single-handedly, I think, allowed me to play at the highest levels possible. And I ended up living in a racquetball court. And my kids live in racquetball courts. So uh, isn't that weird? Small world. For you to share we that. We have more story. connections. Alicia Kinsler and all in a racquetball court for EIL. Her heart's exploding too, by yeah, the way. I'm like, oh. is it? <laughs> I'm like writing this down. <laughs> wow. Yeah, the racquetball room and Alicia um, for sure. And I think another mentor for me, I, I played in the WSA for the first two years of that league. Um, and so Nikki Serlanga and Cindy Parlo and Brian Escurry were on my team and it was the first time ever in my whole life that I ever came off the bench. I started every game of my career at Duke and um, I didn't get in the game for the first nine games in my professional career. I'd already been coaching. I was an old lady compared to the rest. I think I was 26 and drafted in the second to the last round. And I learned a lot from um, fellow teammates on how to be a better teammate. Um, I had always uh, worked harder than everybody else and kind of had garnered these starting positions and was thrust into in the middle of my coaching career what it was like to come off the bench. I'm so thankful and grateful for that um, kind of mentorship and then how I saw um, other people handle it. And it was just a, a great lesson in who I wanted to be as a human being and how I wanted to allow soccer to kind of, you know, let me live the life that I wanted to live. And then the last one was the Virginia Tech Sorry, the Wake Forest SWA got me really in at Virginia Tech. She was my boss when I was the assistant coach at Wake Forest for Tony Deleuze, who was my number one mentor in my entire life. Uh, but Barb called me and tracked me down when I was playing professionally and told me, you need to hang up the cleats. You only have a year or two left. Be the writing on the wall, Kelly, and come and apply for this job. And without her belief, um, you know, I would have never done it. So some awesome people out there, but, but I think females and males alike, it's about the people you're with. And I think uh, we talked about men supporting us. And I think if we can do the best job of supporting great men in the world who have supported amazing female soccer, I think we do the job just as well. So I've had some incredible mentors. Thank you. We have two more questions, one from Sophie and then one from Julie. So Sophie, what's your next question? Yeah, um, so I was wondering, how can female athletes, coaches, and leaders support one another better? And with your experiences internationally, do you guys see other countries address these issues, like, as well as we do? I'll definitely let Amanda start with that one. I feel like especially the international part, if you don't mind, Amanda, I'd be curious to hear from you first. 
Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll talk about the international one. Um, uh, other countries. Um, you know, it's an interesting it, other country. So my, my work that I do today is really global. So my office is in Amsterdam. I work with players associations like Yael started here in the US with the NWSLPA. But I get to work with the players associations in Colombia and and in South America and Mexico and France and, and England and Sweden. And yeah, I get to see um, kind of the, the, the game through the eyes of players and player unions around the world. And, um, you know, the differences in, in how men and, and women are treated. And I think one of the things that, that often comes up when I'm, when I'm talking to people in other countries is um, like, it's not even really related to sport. I mean, it is, but it's, it's like the, um, the culture of the country and the government of the country and whether or not women are seen and treated as equals first. Um, and that has such a bearing then on how they're treated in sport. So in a lot of cases, women um, soccer players aren't seen as professionals. So I'll give you an example that in Italy, their professional league, what, what we would say is a professional league because they, they play for Juventus or these you know big Italian clubs, and they actually aren't professional players because the law doesn't allow them to. So what that means is that they don't get uh, rights like, um, uh, employment rights like healthcare or retirement or things that you would get if you're working for a company, but the men get it because the men by law can be professional athletes. Luckily in Italy, that's changing. Um, but I think it's a good example that actually culture and law kind of precedes a lot of the sporting decisions that get made. So we had a presentation from a woman in Australia recently, who's the lawyer for, um, the Australian um, PFA, which is a lot like the NWSL um, PA that um, that EIL started. And she got up and gave a presentation because they just formed a new agreement between the players and the Federation, the Australian Federation. And her presentation was maybe like 10 slides all about like how they worked towards um, gender equity in Australia, which they've done an amazing job. The men and the women actually share in the financial rewards of of the federation, and they share equal conditions and 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 um, have equitable treatment. So it's it's really really cool what they've done in Australia. Um, but the first slide she put up in her presentation, in her PowerPoint presentation, wasn't about soccer and it wasn't about the sport. It was about the law in Australia and how women and men are treated equally under the law. That was the starting place. So when I go around and talk to people about in other countries about um, gender equity and about sport and soccer, um, one of the first things I talk to them about is Title IX. A lot of them don't know that we have this law passed by Congress in 1972 that means any institution that receives government funding has to have equal access um, and equal distribution of those funds for men and women. And that has trickled into sports and created opportunities for women's soccer in this country. And it that doesn't exist. Like there is no Title IX for global soccer. There, maybe that's something we should talk about. <laughs> but there's no Title IX in any other country. It's not a thing. So our understanding of equality and the impact of our government regulation on our expectations as women and girls is something that, that um, that looks a lot different in other countries. And a lot of it is very fundamentally rooted in, um, yeah, in, in government and, and law. So I think maybe that's a global look, but maybe um, Yael and, Kay and, and Kelly wanna zoom a little bit more into to, um, more domestic or, or answer some of the, the follow-ups on, on female coaches and leaders. Yeah, Kel Kelly, if you wanna jump in, you can, you're welcome to. I have one little thing to share, but you probably, um, especially maybe in, from the coaching side of things, might have a, a unique perspective here to, to add if you want to go before me. No, you start. Um, okay, well, this might segue into, I don't, I don't know how you feel about this, and I'd be curious to hear. Um, I think a big part of how we can all elevate each other as women, and, and what Amanda pointed out is really 
important because I think quite often as an American, I maybe take for granted that like we're trying to be equal here. Like the understanding is that there's equal opportunity. You know, that's already a starting point that some others don't have. Um, and it goes like, it goes really far in terms of um, not just even at the professional level, but like there are some countries where women, I mean, in terms of basic human rights, we're talking about like, um, we're going way further than just issues of compensation and opportunity to get jobs. So, but in looking at, you know, what I've seen and something I heard once that was really interesting, um, with, I don't know if you guys have worked with Leslie Gallimore much, but um, I, I think Amanda, you definitely have. Somebody asked her, and this was told to me secondhand, but basically someone asked her like, well, how do you recommend we get more women coaching? And she was like, well, simple. If somebody asked me for a recommendation for a job, I, t I say to them, well, are you going to bring a woman on your staff as an assistant? And if not, my recommendation is going to be much different than if you are. And so I think that as women, if we can get ourselves to a position of power or in a, a place where we can hire or elevate others, we make sure to bring other women along with us. If you have an opportunity to hire someone from a job for a job, hire a woman or to recommend someone for a job, recommend women. And it's not because it's unfair and because a man couldn't do the job just as well. It's because that's happened for hundreds and hundreds of years with men. They promote themselves or, or you know, their friends to positions. And so we should do the same as women. And so the best thing that I think we can do is to put ourselves in a situation to promote other women to have opportunities too. But I'm curious, I don't know if Kelly, if you want to share something about that idea or anything else that you've seen. No, I mean, I, I think you're exactly right. And I think early on in my career, I hired more men than women. And I think it showed my insecurities more than anybody else's, you know, which I think is such, was such a good learning experience for me, like challenge myself, be around other really strong females. And I learned so much on the job about how important that was, especially as I got to be somebody who'd been in the business long enough that I'm sort of now on the older side of it. So how do I help and support and promote and and learn from Leslie. I just did my B with her last year. And I felt like if I could have a Leslie notebook, maybe I need a Yael one now too, but if I could have a Leslie notebook or an Amanda notebook, um, I mean, it was an incredible experience to be, you know, around, around somebody like that, who is so strong. I, I to me, I think in, in my role now as a, a youth soccer coach, um, I think it's challenging the players that I work with currently to, strive to help support one another and yet strive to also be the best that they can be. And I think for so long, the idea of that I wanted to be the best player on the team kind of prevented me from being the best teammate or the best, you know, supporter that I could be. And I think that that's hogwash. I think we can be both. So in my role as a coach right now, how do I educate and encourage and lead by example to you know, I want to win every single thing that I do still I'm old and you know, 46 and I don't, I hate losing, but how do I do it gracefully? And how do I do it in a way where I'm also challenging my teammates, lifting them up and being the best teammate possible. And that's filled with so many innuendos and, and giving young women the confidence to be themselves and yet be the best people they can be for their teammates, I think is the best job that I can do right now. on the job that I have as both a mom of two young girls and, um, you know, a coach of young, young, hyper competitive women that I never want to tell them that they're not allowed to try to be the best they can be. Um, and, and yet, how do they support their teammate right next to them in the best way possible? I feel like if we can do a better job of that in this culture of youth soccer, where everything is, you know, club hopping or jumping around or um, I'm, I'm owed this, we're not owed anything, you know, we're owed tomorrow the opportunity to come and train and be the best we can be. And I feel like that's, the gift that I can try to give to, to my current players and, and daughters now um, so that they can be better leaders and, and teammates in the future. Thank you. We started off the call with the kind of the idea of thinking about um, as we listen to you guys, the now what piece. And Julie has a great question. So Julie, can you ask kind of the guiding question yeah, so uh, I'm a parent, <laughs> and I remember when my daughter started playing soccer, she was in third grade, you know, just like at a smaller club, and that struck me immediately, the difference that the boys and the girls were being treated, even at that age. 
I work in the corporate world. I work for a really progressive company where that environment is quite different. So it was really kind of shocking to me. I kind of get fired up and I can see it now. I, I can see I've heard other young ladies um, have shared their stories with us. What can parents do, right? You know, it's a little tricky in the club. You don't want to upset the club because they might be mad at you if you say something, but you know, it, it's a guy's guy's world still. Let's just be honest, I, my observation in the club and to how to approach it in a way that um, willing to listen uh, because I'm not, I didn't play soccer. I don't have any hookups for anybody. So how can we approach it as parents to say, hey, I'm, I'm noticing some differences here. How can we address it? Um, I'm curious to hear from Amanda or Kelly if you guys have a, a, a advice for that because I'm not sure if I do. I think it's a tricky, uh, tricky case. But what you just brought up, Julia, I, I do want to share made me think of a few things having to do with um, like how female and male players are treated that I wasn't even thinking of because I was thinking of facilities and all these things, but it actually goes as far and I'm not sure what you were observing, but as far as the way that um, we're spoken to as players and like at the professional levels, like women being referred to as girls and being talked down to by male coaches, which I've experienced many times, like no way would top male professionals be spoken to like that. And even I would say the most pervasive is not even bad intentions or anything, but just the expectations are so much lower. And this is why in what I do now in my business, it has to do with um, individual skill development. And something that I'm huge on is that people will say to me because I own the company, oh, well, this is girls soccer training. I say, no, this is the one equalizing piece of sport is that any male, female, old, young, if you're good on the ball and you're a good player technically and you have the skills, it's all equal. It, you don't have to prove that you can run fast, jump high, anything like that. It's literally, this is, you know, as a player, when I played with boys, the one thing I could do just as well, not better, is I could play the ball with both feet. I could strike it well. And so for me, young girls should be held to the same expectations as young boys. And so as a parent, to, I think the first step is noticing there's a discrepancy because quite frankly, part of the problem is, and I've for many, many years played in environments where I didn't even realize until later that there was a discrepancy, that it wasn't okay to be spoken to like I was a child and talked down to because to me that was kind of normal. So the fact that you're able to say, you know what, I work in an environment where this wouldn't be okay and to even realize it is I think huge. Obviously then I'm curious if um, Amanda or Kelly have some thoughts on how to address it because that part, I would be a little bit lost if I'm being totally honest myself. Well, before, before Amanda and Kelly jump in, I, I, I want to, I know this isn't for me, but, but as a dad, right, of nothing but girls and only coach girls soccer, um, and I found myself at times, right, I could be at a restaurant or what have you, and a server would bring, bring me my, my water, and I'll say, you know, thank you, dear, right? It just kind of, I thought it was a nice thing, but you come to find later on, it's really not. Right. And so because, again, that's kind of been the cultural acceptance. I think part of part of the thing that parents have to do is hold their coaches and their clubs accountable. You have to approach the individual first to make sure they know. And then and then what are we going to do? Because I think oftentimes and again, Yael and Amanda and, and Kelly, if you want to address this, oftentimes as parents, we're seeing parents voices um, held back. And they're not, they're afraid to go hold the coach accountable for fear of the, re, of the, of the consequence. So I think one of the things that pa parents have to do is they need to go address the coach, make sure the coach understands, make sure the club knows like you would do in any other organization, but then also know where the, where you want to go to hold that coach accountable to demonstrate that for, for the, for, for the players. Um, I think that's, that's one of the big pieces, you know, we often talk about, and, and down here, uh, you know, Natalie put on here, you know, you know, call it out when you see it. So it, you, if you're going to call it out when you see it, it doesn't matter who you're seeing it from. How do you drive that conversation? How do you drive that recognition? And as a dad, I believe that was from my Yale notebook, by the way. <laughs> and, and but it, but it, as a dad of of, of predominant of almost all daughters, it's it's one of the things that I become more familiar. And also working with people like Yael and Amanda and what have you is. You know, I come. I came previous to this from a very progressive company as well, and there's so many powerful people, not just women, not just men, but powerful people 
I think, Julia, what we need to start doing, if we want to drive the change at the, at the lowest level, we've got to hold those coaches to the standard first. That way, by the time that coach becomes the IL's coach or becomes a professional coach or in Kelly's coach, you know, in Kelly's career coming back around, that, that's been instilled in them as well. So that's just what I'd like to add to that. Go ahead, Kelly or, or Amanda, sorry. I mean, I feel like Kelly's probably closer to engaging with parents on this topic than, than I am. I, I, I would add um, something a little more. Uh, Kelly, why don't you close it out? I'll add, here's what I want to add. Um, and it's not necessarily directly, um, I don't know how to, I, I'm not coaching youth soccer at the moment. So it's a, it's a toughie for me to answer directly. Um, but we recently celebrated, it reminds me, we recently celebrated International Women's Day, right? And you remember that the theme was choose to challenge. I don't know if you guys remember that. There's a lot of social media around this idea of choosing to challenge. And there was a lot of celebration about people who've challenged gender inequity um, over time, which I think is is absolutely smashing. And we need, to we need to celebrate those accomplishments and those people who've spoken out and led the way for change. Um, but I, I personally struggled with that day and with that theme because it's really hard. Like it's really hard and, and to challenge systems of injustice that, um, that we didn't create, we didn't know even existed. And then you get into the mix and you're like, oh my God, if I challenge this, what's the impact that's gonna happen to me, to my children, to the world down the line, right? And it's, um, and, and I, think, um, I think that that, um, that's hard. I, I guess I'm just acknowledging the, the challenge of it. I've worked with a lot of players now around the world who I've seen um, face real, uh, real harsh, horrible situations and found in themselves the, um, the bravery to stand up and speak out about, um, about inequalities or about um, injustices that, that had occurred. Um, and I've seen the consequences of, of some of that. And it's not, um, it's not, it's not easy, but um, there comes, there came a point for those players when the, the consequences of speaking out outweighed the injustices that they were facing. And they recognized that if they did speak up and speak out, it would affect people down the line and in the future for the rest of their lives. So there might be some immediate challenges, really difficult conversations, maybe changing, you know, developing environments, changing teams. I don't know what, I, again, I'm not coaching any soccer right now, but, but I think it's understanding that that it, it's hard. And I'm, I'm just, I think I'm acknowledging that, but also saying that hard things lead to positive change and that we, we need to think as a, as, a, as a community trying to make soccer better for everyone. Um, and that's a hard, that's not always, um, it's not always easy. I mean, I, it's, 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 it's not a direct answer and it's very theoretical, but it's really grounded in some, some recent experiences I've had with players. And, and that's, um, I guess, acknowledgement that your question is really valid and really real and really hard. Yeah, I, I would, I mean, I would agree. And I think, um, I think everybody that's answered on this topic has some really good points in terms of, you know, the, the parents not wanting to rock the boat. Um, I feel lucky Julie and I have been gotten down a road because of this partnership that we've had. I obviously am so lucky to coach her daughter, Gabby, which is a joy of mine. Um, but to get to know Julia a little bit better here has been a sidebar positive to this whole thing. And I, I think my answer to you, Julia, too, would just be to listen and trust and kind of be there for people who are trying to fight the good fight. Because to Amanda's point, there's days I get so emotional about some of the differences that I see that I'm almost counter doing stuff counterintuitive to what I want to do. And yet I don't want to be ashamed of those emotions and the passions that I have. And so it's one foot in front of the other every day, trying to be um, the best that we can be and to serve you families, Julia and Gabby and all the families in our club. And so my, I think my, my really long-winded answer would be to just over communicate and establish trust with your coaches um, and, and come to them and, and hope that they are kind of a, an extension of you. And I hope I've kind of been that for you guys and to continue to kind of go down that road, but fighting the good fight of just 
all things aren't always going to be equal. And I think that's okay. But can we put ourselves in a position where things are sometimes better, you know, for, for us and, and sometimes things are harder for us and vice versa for different genders or races or, but how can we just come to the table and talk about creating something that's culturally driven that's going to be a really honest effort to creating the best environments for every single kid in our club. And I think getting coaches around families like yours um, is the best way to do that. So um, keep bringing, you know, communication to the table, keep trusting your coaches that they're, that they're trying to do the job in the way that's going to be the most, um, you know, productive um, and I hope you and I can continue to work together to create positive change within rising and within the rest of kind of youth landscape here. Wow. So, uh, so grateful to be a part of this panel. I'm so grateful that Rick um, recorded it because times are tough with uh, practices and schedules and everything. And I think it's so important to share all of your advice and your guidance and your experience with so many players now. So um, I just want to extend our gratitude to all of you guys for being here, to um, Yael and Amanda and Kelly for joining, for all the players who came on for a while. Um, this to me was an incredible experience. So I don't know, Rick or, or Julia want to add anything more? Uh, for, 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 my, for myself in Arizona soccer, I mean, just thank you guys. I mean, I appreciate all you guys do. Uh, again, you guys know what big fans I am of, of yours. And for all, all of the folks that have been able to join, um, you know, follow them. Follow, follow Yael, follow Amanda on social media. Um, you know, the social media, Yael will put on some things on, on social media. You will see more ball work done by an individual um, by watching Yael on social media than, than many of you have, have probably ever done. Um, you know, but, uh, but again, guys, Yael, Amanda, and Kelly, again, thank you very much for everything, guys. Um, and I look forward to uh, continuing to keep the conversation moving here in Arizona. Thank you all so much. That was great. Thanks for having us. And thanks, you guys, um, the players. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.